In Philip K. Dick's novel, The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, we encounter a number of these androids passing themselves off, at least at, at some time in the novel, as human beings, many of them revealing that they actually are androids. And perhaps the most interesting of them and the most central to the workings of the novel is Rachel Rosen, who is in a different position than the escaped androids or even the harness bull, uh, the officer who is not going to be targeted by Deckard, but is still you know, going to be suspect. Rachel Rosen will assume a greater and greater role within the novel to a culmination in uh, late in, in the novel in chapters 15 and 16. So we first encounter her at the Rosen Corporation up in Seattle where Rick Deckert as now chief bounty hunter has been sent by Inspector Bryant. Why? To make sure that the Voight Camp empathy test is going to work on these new Nexus 6 androids who are, you know, the top of the line and seem to have some possibility of fooling the test. He also has to make sure that the test is not going to be sweeping up humans who lack empathy for whatever reason in the process. So they go to the Rosen Association and he's going to encounter Rachel Rosen and have a little bit of, you know, a chit chat with her about animals and, you know, where they get their stuff. She's also expressing a sort of hostility towards the police departments on behalf of the Rosen Corporation. And she's being passed off as Eldon Rosen's niece. Eldon Rosen is, is a human, we think, and he is, you know, in charge of the corporation as much as anybody can be in charge in this, as we're going to see. There's, there's a, a very interesting insight that Deckard has, and he is going to put her forward as the recipient of the Void Kampf test. Before that, though, let's, let's look at what happens. So he lands the police department hover car on the roof of the Rosen Association building in Seattle. He found a young woman waiting for him, black haired and slender, wearing the he new huge dust filtering glasses. She approached his car, her hands deep in the pockets of her brightly striped long coat. She had on her sharply defined small face an expression of sullen distaste, right? Dealing with these cops, dealing with their nonsense. And much, much later, we get another description of, you know, what she actually looks like. Um, she, you know, we, we get this, uh, here we go. Rachel's proportions, he noticed again, were odd. With her heavy mass of dark hair, her head seemed large, and because of her diminutive breasts, her body assumed a lank, almost childlike stance. But her great eyes, with their elaborate lashes, could only be those of a grown woman. There, the resemblance to adolescence end, ended. Rachel rested very slightly on the fore part of her feet, and her arms, as they hung, bent at the joint. The stance he reflected of a wary hunter of perhaps the Cro-Magnon persuasion. The race of tall hunters, he said to himself. No excess flesh, a flat belly, small behind, a smaller bosom. Rachel had been modeled on the Celtic type of build, anachronistic and attractive. So... Quite, quite interesting. He's, you know, the total impression was good, uh, except for the restless, shrewd eyes. Right? Now, he's going to give her the Voight Kampf test, and what we see is she fails it. And then Eldon Rosen says, well, clearly the Voight Kampf empathy test is unreliable because she's a human being. And they start going back and forth, and Rachel Rosen is taking part in this attempt to, to bribe Rick Deckard to get him uh, turned, to get the, him working for them. They offer him what turns out to be a mechanical owl. They're actually saying that it's a real owl, that not all of them have died. And he is going to, um, you know, try to 
work with them on this. He uh, almost cuts a deal. But what we find is that um, he's actually going to catch her at the very end in um, this lie, right? How does that happen? He says, uh, um, here we go. I want to ask you one more question from the Void Camp scale. Sit down again. Rachel glanced at her uncle. He nodded and she grudgingly returned. What's this for? And he says, my briefcase. Nice, isn't it? Department issue. Well, well, she said remotely. Baby hide, Rick said. He stroked the black leather surface of the briefcase. 100% genuine baby hide. He saw the two dial indicators gyrate frantically, but only after a pause. He says, thanks, Miss Rosen. That's all. She says, you're leaving? He says, yes, I'm satisfied. And then she says, well, what about the other nine subjects? Because they're supposed to be testing it on 10 of them. And he says, well, the scale's been adequate in your case. I can extrapolate from that. It's clearly still effective. And then he says to Eldon Rosen, does she know? Sometimes they didn't. False memories have been tried various times, generally in the mistaken idea that through them reactions to testing would be altered. And then Eldon Rosen says, no, we programmed her completely, but I think towards the end she suspected. And then to her, you guessed when he asked for one more trial. Pale, Rachel nodded fixedly. Don't be afraid of him, Eldon says. You're not an escaped android on Earth illegally. You're the property of the Rosen Association used as a sales device for prospective emigrants. He walked to the girl, put his hand comfortingly on her shoulder. At the touch, the girl flinched, and then Rick says, he's right, I'm not going to retire you, Miss Rosen. Good day. Now, this is a cover. As it's going to turn out, she, do, she does know that she's an android. <laughs> Uh, this is not a big surprise for her. So we can ask, well, what's, what's actually going on here? There's a very interesting thing that um, Rick is going to realize about the Rosen Association. Now, in, in chapter four, um, this, he, he says it this way. The senior Rosen's nervousness buoyed up his own confidence they're afraid of me, he realized with a start. Rachel Rosen included. I can probably force them to abandon manufacture of their Nexus 6 types. What I do during the next hour will affect the structure of the operation. It could conceivably determine the future of the Rosen Association here in the United States, in Russia, and on Mars. The two members of the Rosen family studied him apprehensively, and he felt the hollowness of their manner. By coming here, he had brought the void to them. He had ushered in emptiness and the hush of economic death. They control inordinate power, he thought. This enterprise is considered one of the system's industrial pivots. The manufacture of androids, in fact, has become so linked to the colonization effort that if one dropped into ruin, so would the other in time. The Rosen Association naturally understood this perfectly. Eldon Rosen had obviously been conscious of it since Harry Bryant's call. So we've got this massive, powerful organization that is at the same time for this moment, vulnerable to him. And he's going to notice something else in chapter 5. He could not make out even now how the Rosen Association had managed to snare him and so easily. Experts, he realized, a mammoth corporation like this, it embodies too much experience. It possesses, in fact, a sort of group mind. Now notice what he says next. And Eldon and Rachel Rosen consisted of spokesmen for that corporate entity. His mistake, evidently, had been in viewing them as individuals. It was a mistake he would not make again. So Eldon, as CEO, is not really an individual. Rachel Rosen also is an individual and yet not an individual. There's this paradoxicality to it that is going to come up later on when she is discussing Pris and how hard it's going to be for Deckert to retire her. Now, a little bit later after this exchange, Rachel Rosen actually calls uh, Rick Deckard up. Um, this is in chapter eight. 
And uh, Rick says, all right, what do they want? Uh, as far as he could discern, the Rosens had already proven to be bad news and undoubtedly would continue to be so, whatever they intended. Rachel Rosen's face appears on the screen. Hello, Officer Deckard. Are you busy right now or can I talk to you? Go ahead, he says. We of the association, notice, we have been discussing your situation regarding the escape Nexus 6 types and knowing them as we do, we feel you'll have better luck if one of us works with you in conjunction with you. By doing what, he asks. Well, by one of us coming along with you when you go out looking for them. Why? What would you add, he asks. Rachel says, the Nexus 6s would be wary at being approached by a human, but if another Nexus 6 made the contact, he says, you specifically mean yourself. Yes, she nodded, her face sober. I've already got too much help already, but I really think you need me. I doubt it. I think I'll think it over and I'll call you back. And he hangs up and he says, um, that's all I need. Rachel Rosen popping up through the dust at every step. So she offers help and he turns it down for the time being. Then um, later on, much later on in chapter 15, he's going to finally call her. This is after um, you know, three of the androids have been killed. Uh, first him killing one and then him and Phil Rush. Phil Rush kills uh, the police inspector Garland and Phil Rush actually does kill Lobo Luft. And, and now um, Rick Deckard is in a bad way. He actually takes the Voight Camp test himself and realizes he started to feel empathy for some androids, at least for certain types, ones that he can not identify with, but at least feel something towards. And Phil Rush, the other bounty hunter, after he's been you know, proven to be human, says, listen, buddy, this is basically sex. You, know, you get attracted to one, so have sex with them, then kill them. You know? that, that's how you can take care of this. And Deckard... Deckard is, is moving in a different direction. So he, he calls her up. Um, she appears on the video screen and he says, are you busy right now or can I talk to you? As you said earlier today, it did not seem like today. A generation had risen and declined since he talked to her last. Uh, and all the weight, all the weariness of it had recapitulated itself in his body. He felt the physical burden and... She, she says, I told you without me, one of the Nexus sixes would get you before you got it. And he says, well, you were wrong, but you're calling anyhow. Do you want me to come down there to San Francisco? And, she, and he says, yes, come down tonight. And she, they go back and forth. She's like, ah, it's kind of late. You know, um, I, I, it's an hour drive. They haven't had dinner. And so he tells her, you know, um, oh, okay, you're just being androidic vengeful, right? Because I tripped you up on the Voight Camp scale. And um, she says, I can tell you really don't want to do this job tonight, killing the last three androids. Maybe not at all. Are you sure you want me to make it possible for you to retire the three remaining androids? Or do you want me to persuade you not to try? And he says, come down here. We'll get a hotel room. And she says, why? And he says, something I heard today about situations involving human men and android women. Come down here to San Francisco tonight and I'll give up on the remaining Andes. We'll do something else. So she, she flies down and they meet in the hotel room and they're going to have conversation and then some sex and then some more conversation. And we actually learn a lot in what's going on. And Rick's Feelings that are shifting within him are also coming to light. So one of the things that we learn is that one of the androids that has to be retired, Pris, is actually the same model as Rachel is, the same Nexus 6 type, as she calls it. And this produces a kind of, not empathy as such, but rather identification and Rachel actually says, you know, we're not really individuals. I'm just a type. And, you know, when, when I die, maybe Pris would step into my spot and take over. And we know that Pris actually called herself Rachel Rosen earlier in the book when introducing herself to Isidore before she changes her tune. So that's a, an important thing right there. And uh, Rachel then reveals why she came down, 
Was it just to, you know, enjoy time with, with him? And she says, um, here's what's actually going on. And he, he, she says, do you know why I really came here? Why Eldon and the other Rosens, the human ones, wanted me to go along with you? And then Rick says, to observe, to detail exactly what the Nexus 6 does that gives it away on the Voight camp test. Now, that's kind of an unlikely Thing because she's not going to be watching him giving Voight Kampf tests. So she says, on the test or otherwise, everything that gives it a different quality. And then I report back, and the association makes modifications of its zygote bath DNS factors, and then we have the Nexus 7. So this is part of a continual improvement program, you could say. Um, she is there to give her corporation, the Rosen Association, a better idea about where the androids betray themselves as not being human. And so she says, um, and when the, when the Nexus 7 gets caught, we modify again, and eventually the association has a type that can't be distinguished. And Rick says, do you know about the Bonelli reflex arc test? And she says, we're working on that too. You know, someday the Bonelli test will fade into yesterday's hoary shroud of spiritual oblivion, right? And it's interesting what... He, he says, or what Dick says, at this point, Deckard could not discern her degree of seriousness. A topic of world-shaking importance dealt with facetiously. An android trait, possibly, he thought. No emotional awareness, no feeling sense of the actual meaning of what she said, only the hollow formal intellectual definitions of the separate terms, right? And so now she's come clean, right? She was going to help out, you know, it's going to be very good for her to come along. Now she's actually part of this, this you know, quality improvement uh, pattern. And she seems to be on his side, right? She shows him a device that will uh, incapacitate any android. So if Ray, Roy Beatty, who Deckard is most afraid of, bursts in on them, he can he can freeze Roy Beatty and then laser him. She, um, you know, makes a deal with him. She says, okay, you know, I'll, I'll take care of the most difficult one. I'll kill Pris for you. You can have the bounty. You just have to have sex with me. You just have to make love to me. And she actually tells Deckard, I love you. In fact, she does it kind of jokingly, and she says that, um, you know, if, it, here we go, if I entered a room and found a sofa covered with your hide, I'd score very high on the Voight Camp test, right? And she says, go to bed with me and I'll retire Stratton. Okay, because I can't stand getting this close and then not. And Rick is grateful, as we see. Thank you, he said. Gratitude, undoubtedly, because of the bourbon, rose up inside of him, constricting his throat. Two, he thought. Now I only have two to retire. Would Rachel really do it? And she says, God damn it, get in bed. So they have sex. And then afterwards, they, you know, they order some coffee. They're laying around, enjoying the afterglow. And then Rachel reveals the real reason, right? This quality enhancement thing wasn't the real reason. Just helping out wasn't the real reason. What is this about? This is about turning him in a way that, that they weren't able to with bribing. She's able to arouse feelings within him that are going to incapacitate him as a bounty hunter. So, here we go. She, he says, um, this is my end, he said to himself as a bounty hunter. After the babies, there won't be any more, not after this tonight. You look so sad, Rachel said, putting his hand out. He touched her cheek. You're not going to be able to hunt androids any longer, she said calmly. So don't look sad, please. No bounty hunter has ever gone on, Rachel said, after being with me, except for one, a very cynical man, Phil Resch, and he's nutty. He works out in left field on his own. And um, she reveals that she knows the androids that he's hunting. And then um, Deckard says, I doubt if it works as often or as well as you say. And she says, well, it has with you. And he says, well, we'll see. And she says, I already know. When I saw that expression on your face, that grief 
I look for this. And he asks, well, how many times have you done that? And she says, seven or eight. No, actually nine. And the only one, the only bounty hunter who's come through this, having you know, sex with me, having his emotions directed towards me as an android, and then been able to go on and hunt, is Phil Resch. All the rest of them had to hang it up. And so he says, you know, I think I'll kill you. Um, and she like tries to go for her laser tube, can't find it in her purse, and then sort of gives in. And there's this, this interesting uh, here, thing here. Um, the dark fire waned, the life force oozed out of her as, as he had so often witnessed before with other androids. The classic resignation, mechanical intellectual acceptance of that which a genuine organism with two billion years of the pressure to live and evolve hag riding it could have never reconciled itself to. And you know, she says, please just you know, make it painless. Um, and he says, well, I can't do it. I'm not going to kill you. And um, she ends up saying, you've gone the way of the others, the bounty hunters before you. Each time they get furious and talk about killing me, when the time comes, they can't actually do it. So she is going to get dropped off, and Deckard is going to go on and kill the remaining three androids. And it sounds like that's the last part of the story, but there is actually kind of a denouement that will happen uh, near the end of the book. Uh, it's in a very short chapter, chapter 20, which is only two pages. Um, Rick Deckard is, is coming back after having eliminated the androids. He's reported into his boss. He lands on his roof uh, of his apartment building. His wife, Erin, meets him on the roof. She looked at him in a pe deranged, peculiar way. In all his years with her, he'd never seen her like this. And he says, ah, it's over. I've been thinking, Mary, maybe Harry Bryant can assign me to. And then she says, Rick, I've got to tell you something. I'm sorry, the goat is dead. The goat that he had bought with, um, or at least began buying, putting it on installment with the first three bounties that he had been paid. Now notice what happens next. For some reason, it did not surprise him. It only made him feel Worse, a quantitative addition to the weight shrinking him from every side. And he says, well, if it gets sick, and she said, no, it didn't get sick. Um, something horrible happened. Somebody came here, got the goat out of its cage, dragged it to the edge of the roof, and pushed it off, he said. Yes, she nodded. And he asked, did you see who did it? I saw her very clearly. Barbara was still up here fooling around. He came down to get me and we called the police, but by then the animal was dead and she'd left. A small, young-looking girl with dark hair and large black eyes, very thin, wearing a long fish scale coat. She had a male pouch purse and she made no effort to keep us from seeing her as if she didn't care. No, she didn't care, he said. Rachel wouldn't give a damn if you saw her. She probably wanted you to, so I'd know who'd done it. He kissed her, you've been waiting up here all this time. Only for half an hour, that's when it happened half an hour ago. Erin gently kissed him back. It's so awful, so needless. And then he says, not needless. She had what seemed to her a reason, an android reason, he thought. So, you know, not only displaying a lack of empathy, but a sort of vindictiveness on her Part because he, you know, she actually says, "You love that goat more than you love me or your wife or anything else," and that's the last that we hear of Rachel Rosen. We know she's got about another two years to live, at most, as a Nexus Six android, and she might continue on trying to eliminate further bounty hunters. We don't, we don't really know. She leaves the story at that point, but th this is one of the most interesting depictions of an android in this great novel, The Androids Dream of Electric Sheep.